Welcome back to another edition of Wolverine TV. This is a first for us. You get to see Doug Skeen up close, and we apologize in advance. So, you should have seen him when his face was a little bit closer to the screen, man. So uh, We're just happy you're here after the near-death experience on the golf course. I apologize for that. I hope your wife's not mad at me. Uh, if In case you didn't hear the story, we were on the golf course. I'd had a few too many to drink. Doug, in his wisdom, let me drive. And uh, we almost went over a hill. I'm telling you, if not for the super strength in that repaired knee of yours, uh, it could have been ugly, man. So, it was, it, Ballas, it wasn't even the repaired knee. It was well, the non-repaired knee, which so it may have been rep the repaired knee. It may have been the second repaired knee. Had it not been for your gross negligence and irresponsibility and my lack of situational awareness to know better to let you drive on a golf course. That was <laughs> one of us wasn't drinking out there. Who was it? It wasn't me. It was Doug Skeen, Mr. Serious About Golf, Mr. Painter's Table Fix Anything. So, mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was the one who shot the best scores all weekend as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, there you go. So, um, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, that's really tough when you're playing a bunch of drunks. So, anyway, you did shoot 33, <laughs> though, last night from what I understand, right? I did. Uh, so, last night, I uh, shot the best nine holes in my um, little local league. Um and uh, yeah, bur a, bur a bogey free three under 33 at Tyrone Hills Golf Course. And uh, I was in the zone ballast. So if you think that I'm, I'm going to get worse somehow so you can somehow hang with me, I'm doing the opposite here, ballast. We're going in the opposite direction. And what this is called is the tail lights for you. I'm leaving you in the dust. I had no illusions about ever beating you. I'm out there having fun. And thus the. <laughs> The several adult beverages while you're sitting there looking through your card and trying to get the exact measurements and all that. I'm like, hey, you know, what's in the cooler? So anyway, we're glad you're OK. I'm glad I didn't kill you. That would have been tragic. Uh, we would have had one less analyst this fall and that would have been really tragic. So and of course, all the family considerations and everything else. So but it didn't happen. So we don't worry about it. Let's talk about some football here. Um, first things first, man, I, I know that you're not bullish on this team, to say the least. And and I was thinking about this and in speaking to James Ross, who's now at Hope College, he's a, a linebackers coach there, did a great job as a GA here, was a great linebacker here. Great guy. This is a guy who's going to be rising in the coaching profession. You know what he said? He said last year was the weirdest year we'd ever gone through. He said these guys were always in flux. And he said different than other programs. And I understand that everybody was in the, in the same boat to an extent. But you know how Michigan is when it comes to safety and everything else. They're going to be the leaders and best in that area. And these guys were constantly put uh, testing and everything else. And to the point where there was they were stopping and starting. There were guys out and then there were guys in. They didn't get to play any spring ball whatsoever. Uh, playing in an empty Michigan stadium. Uh, part of me wants to give these guys a pass for last year and say, hey, it was a fluke and that Jim Harbaugh had earned that with his past. And I understand, no, they haven't beaten Ohio State. I understand they're not meeting the championship standards, which are a little bit tougher now than they were when you played with all due respect. Uh, I'm a little scared to say that to you yeah, with the look on your face. But uh, to me, uh, you know what? I'm, I think that's part of the reason that Jim Car Harbaugh got his extension. And I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that, hey, this year is going to be different. Why are you not in that same in that same boat? Well, I, so so I, I, I'm not dismissing any of those things, Ballas, and for any of the players that were on that team last year. But I, as, you, as you sat there des describing this, I was thinking of the University of Wisconsin, which I think missed – what, three of their first four weeks, they had COVID problems. Were, were they not testing every week? Were they not having the same safety standards? And what about Ohio State, who had co a COVID problem later in the season? And all the teams, and, and quite frankly, throughout the country that had these problems. So, But the first one that came to mind was Wisconsin. They missed a few games right out of the gate. And, right. and I, don't think they, I don't think they had spring ball. I don't think they had any advantages. Uh, I felt like it was kind of a mess for all the Big Tens specifically. Obviously, the teams down south uh, were a little more liberal in the way they approached the football season as it relates to COVID. But I thought the Big Ten teams all kind of had the same equal footing. Um, maybe there were some differences that I'm not aware of. But but ultimately, uh, the schedule and the way it worked out, the practices, the practice time for these teams were the same, and the results on the team on the field for these teams was dramatically different. So although I can sympathize and understand just on, you know, from a personal level, how, how 2020 was for all of us. 
in our in our personal lives, whether you're working like you and I do, or, or whether you're trying to get through a college football season or the softball season, doesn't matter what it is. It was a difficult year, but but some teams found a way to be successful and really really good within all of it, and some teams absolutely melted and fell apart and. It didn't look good, and unfortunately, Michigan was one of those teams that melted and fell apart. And yeah, Jim Harbaugh owns that, just as every player that was on that team owns that part of Michigan football history, and it was a mess. It really was, and we'll talk about the 1984 season in a minute when they had the lack of leadership, and I thought there were some parallels there. First things first, I want to thank Lewis Jewelers for being a sponsor of this podcast. They've been a partner of ours for a long time. I highly recommend them. Uh, fantastic people. And uh, Manscaped, uh, 20 go blue, manscaped.com to get 20% off grooming tools for your manhood. Skeen, um, we're going to send you a kit, yeah, probably for Christmas. That'll be your Christmas bonus. You can shake your head. It's a fantastic product. 20 go blue at manscaped.com. I actually wore my manscaped shirt when we went out to dinner up north. Got a few looks uh, at the, the slogan on the back. Your balls will thank you. Uh, and they certainly do. My golf balls did not, however, and I sucked. But uh, that's another point for another day. So let's get back to Michigan football and talk a little bit about the 1984 team. And when I do the Where Are They Now is, and you were one of the first ones I did back in the early 2000s, actually probably the, that was like the fifth year doing it. That just goes to show how old we're getting here. But uh, you and I talked about leadership and about how you feel good about former Michigan players being in that building as coaches. And I get that too. Uh, the one team when I was doing where are they now is before 2007 that everybody talked about lack of leadership was 1984. And Jim Harbaugh happened to be on that team. He broke his arm early in the year, left one of your leaders on the sidelines. He came back and the 85 team was outstanding and had great leadership, but to a man, all of the underclassmen on that team said we did not have great senior leadership. I think if you look at last year and guys talking about sitting out and going to the pros and opting out and everything else, I see some parallels there. And what I'm hearing from guys like now are saying, hey, we're going to change this culture. This is never going to happen again. Uh, I'd love to believe that that can happen again and that, hey, maybe last year was the anomaly because in other Jim Harbaugh seasons, uh, yeah, they had some bad losses. They came back strong. The year, two years ago, when they lost to Wisconsin on the road, and everybody was embarrassed, they came off and came out and whipped off a bunch of nice wins, right? And uh, said they were going to turn it around and did. So uh, I'm willing to give them a, an opportunity here, and I think probably that's what Ward Manuel did too, and saying, "Hey, you know, this is the anomaly compared to the rest of those years." Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of credibility to that, Ballas. I, I, you know, again. Uh, 2020 will, be, will, will always be remembered as one of the worst seasons in Michigan football history with the asterisk next to it as to why that happened. But if you're going to draw parallels to the 1984 team, which was six and six, and, and in the modern era of Michigan football, mostly considered the most embarrassing team in the last 30 years leading up to the last year's team, you, you can absolutely say, OK, leadership matters and leadership matters every year. And at this point, you know, here we are, early summer, season's a few months away, and, and we can only hope that the young men that are on this team coming into this fall find a way to learn the lessons of last year, realize what killed them, realize what they need to do to win, uh, take a hard look in the mirror and decide what am I going to do different for Michigan football and my team this year, and far less of what am I going to do to protect myself and my football future and far more of a, what am I going to do to help this team? Because uh, there's been a lot of talented football programs in America um, that have all kinds of football talent, but they don't ever win anything. And we used to always kind of snicker in the 90s, right, when Michigan was handling Ohio State. And every year they had lots of NFL draft picks, high NFL draft picks, but they couldn't find a way to beat us because we played team football. We played tough Michigan football. And now the roles are reversed in that Michigan has lots of NFL talent in its football program, but we can't find a way to win the big games and the big moment in spite of the fact that we have a lot of good football players. And now other, other programs, Ohio State, Michigan State, and others are kind of laughing at us. As a former player, it's irritating and, and painful to watch. I can only imagine what it be what it must be like for the players in the building that deeply care for Michigan football in the program. Uh, the guys that have come and gone in the last few years that were only in it for themselves, they're not going to care. And you know, from my perspective, 
I wish they would have gone somewhere else. I wish they would have played somewhere else because they didn't help us win. And, and the, the, the lesson that I was taught, that we were taught in that era, was that you come to Michigan to play for Michigan. And when you do those things and you do them right, if you have enough talent, you will have an opportunity to go play in the NFL. That formula worked for 30-plus years, Ballas. And why can't it work now? The answer is it can work now, but the players have to make it work. Yeah, you got to find the right guys. And then part of that's in the recruiting process. And uh, they always dug a little deeper, man. I remember Fred Jackson telling me, Michigan's former running backs coach, he said, we went and talked to their teachers. We went and talked to their parents. We went and talked to their friends. We went and talked to their friends' parents and really got to the bottom of what a kid was looking for. And uh, I see that going on in the basketball side of things with Juwan Howard. I always saw it with John Beeline, who did an unbelievable job recruiting character for the most part. And uh, they do their homework. So, And I'm not saying they're not doing their homework now, but they seem better equipped. And I don't know if you're encouraged by it, but all these recruiting office moves. Uh, you've got Courtney Morgan coming back. You've got help for him. It's not just one guy and Matt Dudek doing all the evaluating and then going out and having to identify all these players. At that point, you start recruiting from lists. And what interests me, and again, we go back to, to when you and I talked the first time and we were talking about some of the guys that they brought in there that kind of flamed out. And Coach Gary Moeller asked your opinion on some of these guys. And uh, I want you to tell the story, first of all, about the, uh, the, the top lineman when you were a freshman and Bo Schembechler was still your coach and you had the number one lineman in the country and you and I think Steve Everett or somebody else were hosting him. Bo came in and asked you guys what you thought of him after spending a weekend with him. Tell us what happened. Yeah, it was standard practice. Uh, so, you know, they, they still do it today. When you bring young men on campus, the hosts for the weekend are typically your current freshmen because those groups of guys are going to be so closely packed together. They're going to spend a lot of time together, hopefully three or four years together. And so in the, at that time, uh, a young man from, from the state of Florida came in for an official visit and spent the better part of Friday night and Saturday telling us how he was going to come in and dominate. And uh, we were nowhere as good as he was ever going to be and, and basically talking junk the whole weekend. And um, before on Sunday mornings, before they would send these kids home, uh, the head coach would sit down and talk to us before they brought these high school kids in. And at that time, that's when offers were extended. That's when, when you know, coaches would say, we want to offer you a full grant and aid, as they used to call it, as Bo used to call it. And uh, Bo had asked us about this young man. And uh, it was myself and Steve Everett and Joe Cacuzzo and Chris Hutchinson sitting around a table. And, and Bo asked the question, and we all kind of looked at each other and didn't say anything. It was like one of those moments where, you know, yikes, what do we say? Because this is a highly recruited kid. And before we could speak, Bo slammed his fist down and said, I've heard enough. Your silence tells me all I need to know. He's not the kind of guy we want here at Michigan. We're going to send him home. And we didn't offer him a scholarship. Bo didn't offer him a ride and send him on his way. And he never came to Michigan. And you know what, Bowles? We were just fine without him. You know, the guys that came in after did him, okay. the young linemen that came in after him did just fine. And Michigan yeah. continued to win. And so that formula works. Character matters. And you got to bring in the right guys. They're going to be the right kind of people in the locker room to lead their peers and lead the new young guys that are coming in as they get to be sophomores and juniors and seniors. So leadership absolutely counts. And I don't care if it's a football team or if you're an organization trying to sell whatever or build whatever. It doesn't matter. Leadership always matters. Let me ask you, do you remember the kid and, and what happened to him? Do you remember where he went? Did no, he I, I couldn't even tell you his name. I remember he was a big old, big old physical specimen, had long, yeah. dark hair. And um, I think he ended up going to Florida State or something. And I don't think he ever saw the field. No okay. kidding. Um, and that's you know, how that worked. Yeah. Because never saw the field. About it in his, you know, in his, yeah, go ahead. Humi humility matters, I think. And, and it's part of leadership. You know, the guys that walk around and it's OK to talk a little junk to your buddies and say, you know, whatever. We all we all did that, but not in the way, not in the way that's malicious and detrimental to the team. And that's what this guy was all about. And some of those guys later in your career that you took out and you could tell these guys that they were recruiting from lists and you guys had earned the right to get into the doors of these top level recruits with 
five Big Ten championships. You've got, still got the rings somewhere, um, hidden away in a safe or something like that. But you told Gary Moore the same thing, and he took a risk on a few of these guys. And for a couple of years there, <laughs> you used the term jackass farm. <laughs> and uh, I remember – all I remember was reading about pipe, go- pipe bombs going off and guys getting 0.0s, and uh, it got a, a little bit messy there for a while. And Lloyd Cart, with all due respect to Gary Moeller, was a great coach. Um, yeah. You know what? Lloyd kind of cleaned that up and and kind of got them back to where they needed to be i thought well you know i i michigan's been through that i think we, we talked about the recent teams in michigan last year specifically we can look back into maybe a recruiting class or two we can look here bows in the last five years look at michigan state mark d'antonio had had the the momentum all going and then he brought in a, a couple classes of guys that were there for the wrong reasons and it can blow up your entire program and if you let it it'll derail it for years and so you do have to you you know you do have to pay attention to the quality of the young man you're bringing into the program so that you don't ruin the culture you don't ruin the team atmosphere you don't ruin the mission of what we're all here to do which is work together to make each other better, to go on and win for the team. And if we all do that, then we will then get the individual rewards and individual uh, benefits of being a part of that team. And then from, from us, from the chair I'm sitting in now, you know, 30 years later, those lessons still hold a lot of value long after football is over. And you get to carry those experiences and that kind of leadership knowledge that you learn when you're part of something like that on to whatever it is you do after sports is over with. Yeah. I was there when you won the five, by the way, in school at the same time. I was wondering, I think that deserves one of those rings, maybe. Can I pick the one? Can no. I pick the night? No, you're not getting, no, Ballas. You can't even beat me at nine holes of golf. I'm not giving you one of my rings. Are you nuts? All right. Well. <laughs> I don't even let you touch it. Don't even, you won't even let you touch it. <laughs> Can I polish it? I'll give it back, you know? <laughs> so, all right. I got to ask you this, Mike Hart. I-, I love this hire. I loved it when it happened. I love the Ron Bellamy hire. Uh, these guys were part of championship football at Michigan. And again, I go back to when you first talked to me and you said, Hey, I love, there's something about that that makes me sleep better at night. Knowing those guys are in the building. Uh, Mike Hart from everything we've heard is a no nonsense guy. He's not a player's coach. And I like that about him. Les Miles was not a player's coach. Uh, he made you better as your offensive line coach. Uh, you know, whatever's happened since then, you know, is, is a different story. But when he was there, he got the best out of you. I like that hire. And to me, the offseason hires give me hope. Uh, do they not give you some hope that, hey, Jim Harbaugh has identified some of these problems and he has addressed them? Recruiting being another one that we just talked about. Uh, it, you know, I've, I'm predicting a seven and five season. I've gone on record as saying that. But I like the direction. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, I've talked about it in our previous podcast. I'm a big Mike Hart fan, Ron Bellamy, and uh, Courtney Morgan, who's now the recruiting guy, and and all these guys that were tied to the Lloyd Lloyd Carr era of Michigan football, where we were playing in very high levels, and good character guys that were talented enough to go on and play in the NFL. Those things bode well for the teaching and the passing of the knowledge to the current program, which clearly needs some of that. And so... I think the world of these young men and these guys that are leading this football team, will it translate into victories on the field again in the games that matter most? God, I hope so, because it can't get much worse than being down 28 nothing to Wisconsin and not even being close against Ohio State and getting beat by Michigan State with, you know, rosters that have half the talent. And I don't mean that with any disrespect to Michigan State, but last year they beat our butt with half the football talent. And so hopefully Mike Hart and I think Mike Mallory, the Doug Mallory, I can't remember which one of the Mallory brothers is now. In it's, the Doug. Yep. it's Doug. So and all the all these former players that were there and lived it, hopefully we'll be able to inject some of that knowledge and some of that, some of that expectation into this current team, which is, which is, it's an interesting point to make, Ballas, because our head coach was there during that time. And Jim Harbaugh should be the one leading this charge. But here you and I are talking about the fact that, that, that you know, we need some other coaches that to, to come in and bring this. So, you know, it's frustrating that, you know, you and I have this hope at this point, six years into the Jim Harbaugh era. I'm not sure why we have to go hire a bunch of Michigan guys when we have one of the best, most successful Michigan football players and NFL guys leading the program in the first place. But you know what? We'll take it because we yep. stink right now. 
You are what your record is. Right now, Michigan's coming off of a two and four season where we were not very good and a lot of things to ask questions about. But man, let's hope it gets better this fall. Yeah, it needs to flat out. And I think by giving three year contracts to these guys, I think I'm not going to say that it's a guarantee that Jim Harbaugh is going to be here in two or three years, but I do think that he's going to be given some time. Uh, it's, you know, if they were to implode, say they went one in 11 or something like that, then you're almost forced to make a move, right? But I think the expectation is to improve the program now to the point where, you know, I, I know you're always about championships, but to me, it's improving every week and showing, getting the culture back to where it needs to be is the first step. And you and I have talked about that a lot and you hate to see it and uh, what, what it's become of it since Lloyd Carr left. And it doesn't make any sense uh, to me that it should be that hard. But we've seen it at just about every school uh, in the country where they had a down period for the longest time. Michigan hadn't. Uh, they got theirs. So well, this, to this, me, that's the first step. Yeah, this this fall balance, I think, is critical. I mean, you say that the gym's going to be given some time. I would tell you that he's been given time. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we'll see, right? They, they, they did cut his salary in half. Uh, I think Ward has positioned and set the table that if this thing goes south worse than it already has, then the, the, the door is not going to be so hard to open and, and escort Mr. Harbaugh out and, and start over. Um, so it's it's it, this this fall is critical. And, and if, you know, you say, you know, five and seven, eight and four, seven and four, eight, you know, whatever the number needs to be. What I'm looking for is that eyeball test. It's hard to describe, but Michigan fans know what we're talking about here. Yeah. And what I'm not talking about is, like I said before, being down 28 nothing and the game's over at the half against Wisconsin for the second year in a row. Uh, not being competitive against your rivals. You know, how about we get within, you know, a 10 point loss to Ohio State? And as sad as it sounds, how about we, how about we shoot for actually beating Ohio State and being competitive and playing our best football in that game? And, and not to mention the Penn State, the Michigan State game, and, and Indiana now seems to have no problems with rubbing our face in it. So the, the, I would say, you know, on the surface, an 8-4 and four season will be a nice rebound from a team that's coming off of the 2-4 and four disaster of a year ago. But if those losses against our biggest rivals in those biggest games continue to be absolute disasters, I think Ward's going to have a challenging uh, uh, a situation ahead of him at the end of this football season. Let's hope it does not go there. There's enough football talent in that building. We already know that. I've, you and I have talked about it. we got draft picks coming out every year. A lot of wonderful young men going on and playing in the NFL level. There's clearly talent in the building. But somehow, some way, it's not translating into competitive football on the field. Not nearly good enough. And that's what has to be fixed. So what the good news here is that it absolutely can be fixed. The, the, the recipe ingredients are there for success. Can this head football coach make it happen? Last thing I want to ask you, we're going to talk about Mike McDonald and the, the defense in a couple of weeks, but uh, a lot of people not expecting a full Michigan stadium this fall, a full big house. And it was interesting talking to you and some of the people on our, on the Ford at the Wolverine.com saying, you know, I'm losing interest. And you know what? It's, it's hard to blame them when you see the product on the field and the way it's been for a long time. 84, you know, was a one-off, right? Uh, Rich Rodriguez era, you know, then you start seeing things wane. It got, people got a little more excited that first year of Brady Hoke. We saw the crowds really coming back. But uh, in talking to your teammates, it's hard for you guys to watch because it doesn't really resemble the football that you played, the football that I watched when I was in school. And uh, it's, is it fair to say that I don't expect 100,000 people in that stadium uh, for every game this year? I think that the streak ends. And do you think it's fair to say that people are losing interest because of the losing and the bad football? Well, I think the losing and the bad football are part of it, Ballas. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we've all been through the stress of this COVID year, now year and a half. And one of the things that, that last year forced us as citizens of Michigan and beyond is to look at what we're doing in the fall. We didn't have football games to go to. So what are you going to do? Are you going to watch them on television? Well, even the viewing experience on television was pretty lame, right? Empty stadiums and piped in fake crowd noise. Let's be real. It sucked. It, it sucked as a college football fan to watch that garbage. And so, you know, consumers, you know, you and I and everybody else, 
we're creatures of habit. So this last fall, I played more fall golf than ever. And I really enjoyed it being outside on Saturday afternoon. If, if that was such a great experience and the team starts to stink, why not go golfing on Saturday instead of watching Michigan football? And, and you know, I, it's what I did. And I just set the DVR and I'll watch it later. So you and I can talk about it and see what happens. You watch it maybe. Yeah, you oh, watch you're it maybe. It. Right. Yeah, no. I, you're right. I'm kind of, you forced me. I'm, I'm a slave laborer to you, Ballas, and, 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 and <laughs> doing the work that we do. But yeah, you but get paid I, handsomely I, I, I for that, pal. I don't think it's the one thing. I don't think it's the one losing thing. There's 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 an entire uh, Michigan football fan base that is hungry for success. If they show some success and they allow for a full stadium, Governor Whitmer says that you know stadiums are going to be allowed to be full. Let's hope that Michigan, you know, can follow suit and and let that stadium be full. And if you know to to let the fans experience it again and get back to normal and let these players that are on the field feel the excitement of a full stadium again. And the students that go to school at Michigan, I hope it's full. If it's not, and and and, and let's just say, like you, I think you're saying, is if it's allowed to be full by rule, if the governor allows it to happen, and it's not full, the losing, not so good football product will absolutely be part of it. The other part of it I'm suggesting is simply that uh, because of COVID, people find other things to do that were also fun, and uh, and, and I was one of them. You know, I, I like I said, I enjoyed last fall in a different way. So yeah. uh, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me, Michigan football, or I will find something else to do instead of spending my Saturday afternoons watching, watching yep. uh, subpar performance. And, and break records for nine holes for guys over 300 pounds that used to play football. <laughs> so on crappy little right. courses. Crappy little courses. Hey, hey, hey. No, 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 no. I no, know. No, no. That's a nice little golf course. Is it? Okay. Well, there you go. So he's Doug Skeen. I do want to offer our condolences to uh, Lloyd Carr, who lost his wife, Lori, who was a, a beautiful human being. I only met her once in an elevator and just a great person. But Lloyd is a high character guy uh, who's been through a lot here. Our condolences to him and his family. Um, and uh, on a separate note, sign up at the Wolverine.com. 60 days free. Blue 60 is the code there. Uh, thank you again to Manscaped 20 Go Blue, uh, Manscaped.com for your 20% discount. And thanks again to Lewis Jewelers. Thanks, Doug Skeen. We'll do it again in a couple weeks.